I got some more assignment for you. I don't know if you want it or not, but I got some. Well, we've been so long in this message, I told him to call it chapter two. And uh, is there a chapter three or four? I don't know. We'll know when we get there. I'm excited about what I'm about to share. It is going to take kind of a twist after I set some things in motion and then it's going to move to a more practical state. Um, For those of you visiting, all this stuff is available for you through social media and other venues, YouTube and our TV. I think it goes to TV next. And uh, we have a protocol where it bounces and then where it lands. And uh, you can catch all of these messages. There's a lot of word already been taught. I can't back up and do everything. But basically, uh, polls were taken that Christians were some of the most unhappily, unhappy, deeply dissatisfied people in America. And I believe that happiness is not connected to success. Uh, I believe we've been taught by a world system and we've been taught wrong. I have sat in front of multi-millionaires with tears coming down their face and I'm trying to talk them out of killing themselves. Uh, Success has never been about the accumulation of stuff. It's tied to being significant and fulfilling purpose. I've known people that had very little but got up every day knowing they were living their purpose. And they were the happiest people I've ever been around in my life. I've got around people who had everything and were miserable people because you can be successful at the wrong thing. And so I try to live my life with a sense of assignment. When you sense that God has an assignment on your life, it makes the mundane adventurous. Uh, My life in its reality is not filled with adventure every day. My life is filled with a lot of stuff I have to do. I have to do it that I don't particularly enjoy. But the fact is, there's always a sense of adventure tied to it. Number one, because I'm on assignment. Number two, because I'm married to hope. Hallelujah. (laughs) That always keeps it interesting. And so I've attempted to tell to you not practical things first because I didn't want you to think I'm a motivational speaker. Hopefully you're motivated when I speak, but that's not what I am. So I wasn't just trying to come out here and give you practicalities. I wanted to show you how all this was a master plan that took place in heaven before you got here. You were here before you got here. You lived before you lived. You existed before you existed. And all of your days were written in a book before one of them came to be. It all starts with a master plan to your life. But that plan has to enter the earth. And once it enters the earth, then there are some practicalities. That is where I start today. So it's not going to be as heavenly as it is natural from this moment out. So Lord, bless the reading of your word and give me the tongue of a man with supernatural communication ability. I don't want anyone to be confused. I don't want anyone to not understand. Let me speak with clarity and let them receive the word today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. We talk to each other in this church. Tell your neighbor, say, here we go, neighbor, here we go. Go ahead and throw uh, John 3.16 up there. How many of you have ever heard of John 3.16? If y'all hadn't John, turned out John 3.16, I'm going to have to resign and let somebody else pass to you today. I'm gonna... John 3.16, <laughs> this should be the first one you learn. It should be the first one you know. Everybody should be able to quote it. It's the Christian Life 101. I want to start off talking to you about the difference between the earth and the world. We use them interchangeably. In the Bible, they are two totally different things. Two totally different words. Two totally different meanings. And uh, people today who have been around me who had not heard this teaching before told me it was revolutionary to them. Because there are things when when you find out the the true essence of it, it changes the whole meaning of scriptures for years that you may have just quoted and it really didn't move you that much. And all of a sudden the light just comes on and say, oh, he was talking about something totally different than I thought about. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, not the earth, There are forums being held all over this planet trying to save the earth. 
There are people that think the earth is being destroyed. There are people that think the earth is bad. There are and what people don't understand is the earth in its true essence is pure and innocent. The problem with the earth is the world. If you clean up the world, the earth will be fine. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So the world is broken and Jesus is the answer. So in other words, the only thing that can fix this would be Jesus and his people. Outside of that, there is no other answer for the world. Our world needs something bad. There's new stuff breaking out every day. We are having conversations today that not 10 or 20, or 20 years ago, three years ago, I can't believe we'd be having. Okay? It's the world. <clears throat> it's not the earth. I'm gonna go deeper and I'm gonna show you that. For God so loved the world. The word world is the word cosmos. It means governing systems. Systems, the systems that govern the earth. The earth is fine. Its systems are corrupt and broken. Jesus is the answer to broken systems. Financial systems, judicial systems, justice systems, political systems. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Banking systems. All the system. Jesus is the answer. Now I'm gonna show you. you say, well, how? I'm gonna show you how he is. So in other words, it didn't say for God so loved the earth and it didn't say for God so loved people. Jesus is not just the answer for the earth or for people. He's the answer for the world. So in other words, when you accept Jesus, Jesus begins to turn around your whole world. So the system, how? Jesus is interested in how you systematically function in life. Why did Jesus, if, if it was just about getting saved, why didn't Jesus shoot down here, die, stay there for three days and get it on out of here? Why did he walk around and teach for three and a half years? Because Jesus was bringing something with him called a kingdom. What was the kingdom? It was from heaven. They call it the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Jesus uses those two words interchangeably. The kingdom of God tells you who it belongs to. The kingdom of heaven tells you where it's from. So Jesus came and Jesus the man has sealed my eternity. I do not worry about eternity. My eternity is secure. And when I go to bed every night, I know someday I am gonna live forever in the presence of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus the man has prepared me forever for eternity. But Jesus, his word has prepared me for earth. And there's a lot of people that wanna get to heaven real bad because they are miserable in the earth. So Jesus came because systems are broken, okay? Now I need to go back here to a teaching I did for 52 weeks in 2016 on the word glory. I preached one year. You think you're bad because you eight weeks on assignment. I preached a year on one word, okay? Earth was never, ever expected to operate apart from heaven. God created the heavens and the earth in conjunction with one another. He created the heavens first because he is a spirit. So God created a world that is invisible. There are people everywhere studying an invisible world right now. You are enjoying an invisible world. For people who don't believe that all the invisible world exists, there is electricity that you can't see letting you enjoy the one air conditioner that will run. <laughs> you can't see the airwaves that produce that cell signal. You can't see the sound waves that are allowing you to hear my voice. 
There is a whole world you can't see and there are laws that govern it. Out of the parent realm, the spirit realm, which the Bible says does not change, there is a temporary realm. He created the heavens and the earth. The earth was the physical expression of heaven. That's why the first place in the earth was called Eden or paradise, which means heaven. So they lived in heaven on earth. Okay? God made in his image man. He did not say male. He said man. Okay? Then the Bible says male and female, he created them. I wish I could get on Fox and CNN with that. He created a kind and took the kind and made two genders. I'm not moving on to this whole church claps on that one right there. Okay. Can we just get that settled? <laughs> Don't make me go down these roads. I'll just go off. I love you, man. I really do. But you are not going to have a baby. I'm just going to tell you it's not going to happen. Okay. He made a man, he made his kind, then he made male and he made female. He created them. It is what it is. Biology supports it, science supports it, and the Bible has declared it. Let's move on. Man, I ain't never got a whistle. That's real good preaching. I've had claps and amens, but I done gone to a whistle. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going straight out of the Bible here. Okay. God had a physical earth that was a replica of a spiritual heaven and a physical replica of himself who is an invisible God. And he called him Adam. Adam was the governor of the earth and Adam was supposed to rule the earth just as God ruled the heavens. The same laws that function in the country of heaven was supposed to function in the earth. Adam was given a choice whether to function because love is always proven out of choice. Well, why did God create evil? And why did God, love is always proven out of choice. God gave man a choice to love him. Okay? Adam chose to take the earth and declare independence from heaven. When Adam took of the apple, he said, we will now eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we will run the world out of the earth out of our mind instead of out of our spirit. Because God came in the cool of the day and walked with Adam in spirit, the Bible says. That stopped. The Bible says that at that moment in Romans 8, the whole world was delivered into corruption. Corruption of the cosmos, the world. The Bible calls Adam in Matthew 3 the son of God. That upsets a lot of people. I don't know why. And the Bible calls Jesus the son of God. So God did not have one son. God had two sons. The first one, 1 Corinthians 15 says, is a man of the flesh. The Bible says the second one, Jesus, is a man of the spirit. So God has had two sons. You're either in the first one or the second one. If you're lost, you're in the first one. You're a man of the flesh. If you've been saved and born again, you are in Christ and you are a man of the spirit. <laughs> Can we keep going? All right. Baby, can I keep going? Are you bored? Are we okay? Somebody said, I thought this was practical. I'm going there. <laughs> now, Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and its fullness. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you, this is where I break with a lot of preachers. Okay? So your preacher stands on an island when it comes to these things I'm getting ready to speak out of my mouth. Most would vehemently disagree with me. And I'm sorry that they're all wrong. I really am. <laughs> Look at it. He's di differentiating earth and world. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world. The original intent of God 
was that he created an earth and the systems that governed it would also be aligned with him. That he would be the owner of heaven and he would be the owner of earth and he would be the governor of the world. He would be the governor of the systems. Thus, earth was supposed to operate just like heaven. That's what this whole kingdom thing is. When you see Jesus and the kingdom is like, 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 and the kingdom. That's all he talked about. And most people don't even know what that means. What he's trying to tell you is, you are from earth. I come from a different country. I come from the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was not a religious figure. He was a political figure. He was a king and he brought a kingdom. He did not introduce a new religious code of conduct. He brought a kingdom into the earth. Why? Because the first Adam declared independence. We're going to operate separately of you. And that happened in chapter 3. In chapter 3, Adam took the forbidden fruit and it was called the fall of man. The next chapter, chapter 4, we got murder. That's how fast sin moves. We fell in chapter three and in chapter four, Cain's murder and Abel. I mean, it goes, it deteriorates immediately. So the Bible says that the world has been delivered into corruption. The Bible says that the earth is in the pains of childbirth. It's groaning, it's moaning, why? It was never meant to function this way. It knows something is wrong. That's why there's floods, that's why there's hurricanes, that's why there's droughts, that's why there's earthquakes, that's why there's tornadoes. It, uh, it don't know what to do, why? Because it severed its dependence on heaven. So Jesus shows up. And because God so loves the world, all the systems, he sent Jesus. Jesus died for my sins and prepared me for heaven. But then Jesus goes and walks around and the kingdom of heaven is like, and the kingdom of heaven is like wheat where tares were sown. And the kingdom of heaven is like a coin that was lost. And the king of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like a son that left his father's house. And the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field that one found and for the joy thereof, he went and sold all he had and bought the whole field. And the kingdom is like a pearl of great price. And the kingdom is like a net that brings in all types of fish. And the kingdom is like a mustard seed. And the kingdom. <laughs> Preachers don't talk about it. Jesus never shut up about it. I don't understand. <laughs> Nobody talks about it. And if you read what's written in red in your Bible, it's all he talked about. Listen, this is what heaven, this is what my country, of, you have heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you who hear me love your enemies. Jesus walked right in there going, what? You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you lust after them in your heart, you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying in your country, you function like this. But in heaven, my country, we function like this. You say if someone takes your cloak, take his tunic, but I tell you, forgive and you will be forgiven. And if someone takes your cloak, hand to him your tunic and turn the other cheek. And he is freaking people's minds out because he's spitting in the face of the world system. <laughs> he is coming and directly with his words challenging the cosmos. Oh, I'm teaching. Ah, man, I love this stuff. John chapter eight. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light, not of the earth, of the world. In the Bible, light has to do with knowledge, darkness has to do with ignorance. Light is not the absence of a light bulb. Light has to do with, no, I am the information that corrects the system. Every system in this world is the antithesis of the kingdom of heaven. 
So, okay, let's look. Financial gain and increase. Crush, steal, work till you lose your health, be greedy, cheat people. That's the world system. Okay? Here comes Jesus. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men get. He's just smiling, and they go. And then a guy like Zacchaeus gets so convicted. Because he's a tax collector. He's a thief. And he's been authorized by the Roman government to go around and tax God's people at an enormous rate. And they hated tax collectors because tax collectors taxed above and beyond and padded their own pockets. I know politicians, they don't do that, but it's just talking about, about, about Zacchaeus. <laughs> <laughs> and Zacchaeus heard these teachings and he jumped up and said, whatever I've stolen, I'm gonna go give it back to him time four. That's, that's the power of the kingdom. It exposes the lie. And it liberates the soul because it connects you to God's original intent. How does heaven function? And God, your Bible, it, it, we've been taught, read your Bible and pray every day and pray every day and pray every day. In the Bible is God's financial system, how heaven functions. You need to connect to it when I give you tithe and offering time. Because the company you work for does not have unlimited resources. Heaven has unlimited resources. I'm trying, what are we doing when we do tithe and offering? And preacher goes again, I guess we got to build another building. I'm trying to attach you to another economy. So if this one goes bad, yours is unaffected. So God has a system and I'm not afraid to teach it. God has a marital system. When we go around wanting to redefine everything, it's going to deteriorate fast because it was never meant to operate apart from heaven. And heaven has a, heaven has a system for raising children. Heaven has a system for the people you allow into your life and call them friends. Heaven has a system of peace. Heaven has a system of joy. In fact, the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. And we look at all these people that have no joy and have no peace but go to church. So you can have church and not have the kingdom. <laughs> can I keep going? I know what time it is, but somebody say go on. Somebody say go on. <laughs> the next one in John 8, I forgot what script, but 23, yeah. And he said to them, same chapter when he says, I am the, light. I am the information for the broken system. That's right. Now, you are from beneath, I am from above. You're from down here and you think you know everything. He said, but I'm from where it all originated. I know how it's supposed to run. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not. You are of this corrupt cosmos. He says, I am untouched by it. Okay? You see what he's trying to do here? He's trying to say you live in governing systems. And I'm just not talking about systems out there. We live in systems in the way we run our life that are broken. I'm always talking to people about the way you structure your life. God has a system for you. God has a system for how you manage your time. God has a system for how you qualify who gets access to you. Some of you just give yourself to everybody. Everybody don't deserve you. <laughs> he has one cup of coffee with you at Starbucks and you're telling them everything about your divorce. He has not earned 
that information. That information has to be qualified for. God has ways to do it. Well, tell me, Pastor, we can't be here all week. I'm just trying to tell you, it's all in there, okay? And what Jesus is trying to do, he's prepared me as a person for heaven, but he's brought his kingdom, his word, his teaching. He tells me this is how heaven functions and you can have heaven in your way. Pray that my kingdom would come and my will would be done where? On earth as it already is. I got two more scriptures. Let me go quickly. Revelation eleven fifteen. I'm skipping a lot of stuff. Now I'm going all the. You got sixty six books in your Bible. I've just gone all the way to the end. The book of Revelation is the culmination of all things. Look where this thing is supposed to end up. The seventh angel sounded with, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of the cosmos, the broken, corrupt systems have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Okay, Christ, for those of you who remember, starts with an A, means anointing. Who is God's anointed now? You have an anointing from the Holy One. You remember that? All the, we are the anointed of God now on the earth. The Holy Spirit now lives in his church. Okay. The end result of what is supposed to happen through us is that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his anointed. Here's where I differ from most people. Most people think Jesus is going to come back one day and fix everything. I think the people of God are supposed to fix everything and usher them back. Because the Bible says in Romans 8 that the, that the world shall be delivered into the glorious liberty from, its, from all of its corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The liberators are in this room. Now listen. You might can't change everybody's world, but you can change your world. Then when you change your world with the light of his information, you become a light. And then you go into your office, first shift, second shift, third shift, with your fleet, with your crew, wherever you are, wherever you're at. And all of a sudden, you're different. And they're noticing you're different. And let me tell you what they'll do. They'll make fun of you till they need something. <laughs> I've had people that mocked God and mocked me for serving them until they got cancer. And it was amazing how smart I became. <laughs> people who've made fun of me, people who've mocked my name, and then they get a bad report and they're sitting on the front row. Okay? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Do not hide your light under a bush. For it cannot be seen. But you are the salt of the earth, a city set on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. See, when you forget about trying to change everybody else, and you say, I'm going to take the word and I'm going to change my world, then your world lights up. Then when you get around everybody else and they're depressed and you're full of joy, you stick out. When everybody else's money's affected and your money is totally unaffected, you stand out. When everybody else is bitter and angry and full of poison, but you've learned how to forgive and be gracious and merciful, you stand out. And now all of a sudden you are a light in a dark place. My God, who am I talking to? You become a light in a dark place. And this light likes this light. And this light likes this light. And then all of a sudden we get the revelation. And all the kingdoms of this world have been lit. And they become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Can I have five more minutes?
Now, I think it's Luke 10, and I'm going to quit. Stay with me now. Turn in the curve. Turn. We're in the turn. If we're riding a motorcycle together, you got to lean with me. Okay. All right. So God has done this great thing in you, and you march, march to a different beat. Okay? I love being nice to mean people. It tears mean people up when you won't fight back. I don't hit back. Killing them with kindness. When, when you get this stuff in you and you become a light, then this is what God does. This is the crux and the turn of the whole series. After these things, the Lord appointed 70. He's already got 12. Now he's starting to multiply himself and send them out into cities. He appointed 70 others and sent them two by two before his face into the city. Why did he send them into the city? Because the cities are where the world is created. The systems are created in cities. So he didn't send them to church. See, we believe that we're the salt, but we like to be salt to the salt. And you're the salt of the earth. You are the only thing preserving it. Salt is a preservative. It would have already gone to hell if it were not for you. You are the preservative. Oh, pastor, it's heavy today. It's heavy. Stay with me. <laughs> Send him before his face into the city, every city and place where he himself was about to go. Next verse. Then he said to them, the harvest is great. He said, but the laborers are few. He said, the problem is not the harvest. The problem is when my laborers leave church, they won't say nothing. He didn't say pray for the harvest. He said pray to the Lord of it for laborers. <laughs> for people who will go into it and be a light to it. Yes. Listen, there are people that herald this region that we live in filled with God haters. I have found that not to be the case. I have found this place to be absolutely very spiritual. Most of the people I've encountered, they know something's up there. They just don't know him. I would not say atheist. I would say agnostic. Agnostic acknowledges there's a God, but if there is one, I don't know him. That's what I would say this place is. They don't know the truth. So somebody has to say there's no other name given among men by which we can be saved except the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God. He said, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess to one name. And that's where we've got to be bold. That's why we've got to square our shoulders and know where we are and what we, need, what we have to offer. So he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest. They send labors into the harvest. I'm not at the good thing yet. Hold on. Verse three. Go your way. Behold, I send you as lambs among wolves. He said, this is not going to be pleasant. He said, because where I'm sending you wants to eat you alive. It wants to crush you. He said this 2,000 years ago. It's like he's speaking into 2023. I send you out as lambs among wolves. Next verse. They talked about what to carry, what not to carry. Don't worry about your money. Don't worry about carrying your things. He said, don't worry about who you're going to greet. He said, don't worry about none of that. Verse five. Here's what he said, pay attention to. Whatever house you enter, speak peace. Why do church people always want to point fingers and tell people what's wrong with them? Do you not think people that have problems don't realize they have problems? And y'all have it. Jesus said they're all wolves. He said, and this is what I want you to do. 
peace. I'm not mad at you, San Francisco. Peace. Bay Area. Peace. Silicon Valley. Peace. 2018, I flew in here and I stuck out my hand from the airport. I said, peace. Peace. Not mad at nobody. I'm not picking a fight. For all those of you in torment, for everybody that cried all night last night, for those that can't sleep and those that are depressed and fearful and anxiety ridden. For those of you in the hospital and you wish you could be with your loved ones. I feel the Holy Ghost. Peace. Speak peace to it. Next verse. I know it's time to go. Just hold it. And if the son of peace is there, weird statement. If the son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. You will know your, assi your assignment will always be to a particular geography and to a particular people. You know you're in the right place if there's somebody there that is hungry and waiting to receive what you have. And when what you have falls on it and it is embraced, stay. But if it keeps getting kicked back at you, you're not in the right place. And you know what Jesus said? Excuse my language. Excuse me. He didn't say raise hell. He said, kick the dust off. And just move on. Don't raise Cain. Don't character assassinate. Don't tell everybody how sorry everybody is. That's the worst office environment I've ever been in in my life. Kick the dust off of your feet and move on to next. Because that wasn't your place. <laughs> I end with this. Play something if you would for me, Robbie. Mine and Hope's first ministry experience was not our wonderful congregation in Greenville, South Carolina. Our first ministry experience was in another city called Knoxville, Tennessee. Can I just be very honest with you? Nobody ever knows Ron Carpenter and Hope Carpenter were there. Nobody cares. Nobody came. We were there for one year. We worked our fingers to the bones. We worked from morning to night. We carried a sound system around in our trunk. We met in hotel uh, ballroom. We, we did everything. We, how many people did we call? 20,000? We called on a telephone. 20,000 people got 500 on the mailing list, invited 200. We did, we did everything. Nothing. Won't you love me? I got something for you. I got a U-Haul trailer. I moved to those Appalachian Mountains down from Tennessee to South Carolina. I was a whoop puppy. My first ministry experience, all this passion coming out of Bible school, the world's lost and I'm gonna save it. We basically got spit out of that town. I go to Greenville, South Carolina. Probably in no shape mentally to be starting anything. It exploded. What? Because the man of peace. They were there. They wanted something multicultural. They wanted to see a breakthrough. They wanted to see diversity in the kingdom. They wanted to see walls of racism break down. They wanted to see walls of poverty being destroyed. And my message found somebody to fall. And all of a sudden, 22,000 people showed up. Same run, same hope. The first one, there was no man of peace. Second one, man of peace. Some of you need to receive this word on your assignment. You're not a bad person and they're not bad people. It's just not your place. If everything you try to do keeps getting kicked back, it's not your assignment. It is that simple. 
We didn't do anything different. We didn't sing any different songs. In fact, no one's, we did less because we were out of resources, we was out of money. And it just exploded. So I come here 27 years later and find out that as of right now, there's about 3,500 people that say, you know what, pastor, we want what you got. Let's all do something great together. The man of peace. So I leave that with somebody today. And from this moment out, this whole rest of this teaching is going to be practical. Your assignment is to a people. Your assignment is usually geographical. Geography has everything to do with assignment. There's some people, if you stay in this place, it'll never happen. There's some people, if you leave this place, it'll never happen. There is always a there to your assignment. Always. And these are the kind of things I want to teach you. I have got to stop. Would y'all just stand up, put your hands together, and give God a big clap offering. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord establish you and give you peace. And say this with me. Say, Lord, let me live life on assignment. In Jesus' name. Do I say go Niners? Is that, is that proper? Do I say that? All right. You guys be dismissed. I'll see you here next week. God bless. Have a great day.